is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello and good evening and welcome to a new run of Cross Question, LBC's political panel debate show. We'll be here in LBC's Westminster studio each Wednesday at 8 o'clock on the dot to answer questions from you, LBC listeners. And you can watch us on Global Player, you can watch us on the YouTube feed and Facebook and Twitter. And if you want to ask a question to our panel, just pick up the phone and dial 0345 973. The lines are open now. Now, all previous episodes episodes of the programme are on the Cross Question podcast and this show will appear there just after, just just before midnight. Now it's time to introduce our panel. In the studio with me and socially distanced, as you can imagine, are the Minister of State for Justice and Conservative MP for South East Cambridgeshire, Lucy Fraser. Uh, welcome Lucy, I think it's your first time on the programme. Jonathan Reynolds is a veteran of the programme. He's Labour's Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury and MP for Staleybridge and Hyde. He's in charge of Labour's spending pledges. Good luck with that, Jonathan. Now, joining us from LBC's Leicester Square headquarters and sitting in my chair is Telegraph columnist and Professor of Modern History at the University of Buckingham, Simon Heffer. I'm sure it gives you a sense of power sitting in that seat, Simon. And also joining us from, via the wonders of Skype from Cambridge is Dame Mary Beard, Professor of Classics at the University of Cambridge. She's become a dame since the last time we spoke. Uh, I've got to treat her with even more deference than before. Well, let's crack on. Don't don't forget the number 0345 6060 973. And our first question is from Mark in Hitchin. Mark, what would you like to ask our panel? Uh, good evening. Uh, could the panel tell me how do Conservative MPs and ministers reconcile their position on breaking international law when that is actually against their code of conduct and also against the ministerial code as confirmed in 2018 by the Court of Appeal of which I believe and the government confirmed at that time that international law was required to be met by ministers? So how do Conservative ministers reconcile their position on breaking the law? Well, I have to come to you first, Lucy Fraser, with that. I thought you'd come to me <laughs> first, Ian. Um, so what, what we're doing at the moment is unravelling 40 years of integration with the EU, and it's bound to be complex and difficult. And if I could just explain what the Internal Markets uh, Bill does, is it protects the integrity of the UK internal market. So what we want to do is to ensure that uh, we have access, uh, unfettered access uh, for goods from Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK. And that's essential. We don't want to be in a position where we can't uh, implement import food, for example, from Northern Ireland. And so what we're doing is we're creating a safety net. We're creating a safety net in this bill to ensure that uh, if we don't reach a deal by the end of the year uh, with the EU, uh, we <coughs> won't be restricting our obligations uh, to the rest of the country and ensure well, that's all very stability well, but that doesn't, peace. That doesn't really answer the question, does it? The question was, um, how, can, how you, can you reconcile your position with potentially breaking the law? And that's what Brandon Lewis said would happen if the measures in this bill were introduced. Uh, well, we will be uh, breaching international law if we exercise those powers, and that's uh, hmm. uh, down the line. Uh, but You're a justice minister. How can you defend that? Well, we have to. We don't. Uh, we don't only have international obligations. Uh, we also have international rights uh, under international treaties. And if we find ourselves in a position uh, whereby the EU is breaching or acting in bad faith in relation to its obligations, we have rights and remedies available to us. What, what do you know now that you didn't when you signed the withdrawal agreement? Because. All of this was clear in that. That's what you fought the general election on. It was an oven-ready deal. It was a brilliant deal, according to the Prime Minister. Turns out, not so brilliant. Uh, well, things uh, have developed because under the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, we were to go to the Joint Committee to negotiate certain aspects and detail in relation to the in relation to Northern Ireland. And if it is the case that the EU are now saying they're not going to list us as a third country, i.e., we're not going to be able to have unfettered access uh, to Northern Ireland, then that is not something that we anticipated we, uh, when we entered into the protocol. Now, Lord Keane, your minister colleague at the Ministry of Justice. He's resigned today. Why haven't you? 
Well, Lord Keane, I should say, I, I've worked very closely with Lord Keane uh, and uh, he's a minister in my department. I have a great uh, deal of respect for him. And obviously, he's taken uh, his own position as a law officer um, and it's obviously a matter for him. And I just would like to say that he's uh, done an excellent job for the government. Um, Mary Beard, uh, I saw you um, laughing at one point during Lucy's answer there. Clearly, you disagree with her. Um, doesn't the government have a duty, though, to protect the integrity of the United Kingdom? I'm afraid um, to answer the question rather than your question, Ian, I, I think that what I feel quite reassured by is that so many distinguished Tories can't reconcile this with their conscience. I mean, you see that every surviving Tory leader bar one has come out uh, more or less directly against this. Ex-prime ministers have, you know, actually they know that this isn't on. And they also know, as you hinted, that you know, we had this slightly cobbled together deal uh, which Johnson presented to us, uh, which was all kind of, um, you know, everything was hunky-dory then. You know, now we discover there are flaws. I'm afraid the job of the government is to see what those flaws might be you know, at the start, not to say, oh, whoops, things have changed a bit. Um, now we're going to, you know, to mess around with the treaty. And, and I think that, you know, actually, the responsibility to the integrity of the nation started a long time ago and it wasn't just what we discovered two, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm afraid so it doesn't wash with me and it doesn't wash with John Major or Tony Blair you know, or Michael Howard, you name them. OK. Um, Simon Heffer, you're, you're a Brexiteer. Can you defend this? No, not at all. And to my mind, the real problem here is that a Prime Minister signed a treaty, uh, I think in January, as you said, he fought a general election on what a very good treaty this was, and now he's decided actually it wasn't a very good treaty. Now, look, we've, we're all aware that the Prime Minister has the same regard for detail as Attila the Hun had for basket weaving, <laughs> but he really should. This is such an important treaty and such an important moment in our history. And he really should have taken it seriously. And he manifestly didn't. It's not good enough to say things have changed. You know, if he'd inherited this treaty from one of his predecessors, if, Peter, if um, Theresa May or David Cameron had uh, signed this treaty, then um, he would have a case, a moral case, for saying, well, actually... I don't like it, I've got no mandate for it, we'll have to get something done. But, you know, that has to go through Parliament and has to be a conversation we have with the people who are outgoing 27 partners in Europe. But this is a tremendously neglectful and derelict act on his part. I can't think of another example in, his, in history of uh, a head of government or a head of state concluding a treaty and then within eight months saying, actually, I don't like it anymore. And it's, it's but, but, quite... It's a shocking commentary on the seriousness with which he does his job. Well, it, it, it might well be, but better late than never, he would say, um, if he didn't realise the implications of it then. They realise it now, and they, they say that the integrity of the United Kingdom is under threat. Now, that... It, no government could uh, surely say, just say, well, but, OK, well, we don't... We don't we're not going to take measures to protect the integrity. Uh, we're just going to let it, ru let it run. Well, how abominable to sign a treaty that puts the integrity of the United Kingdom under threat. I mean, what does he think he's doing? What does he think the purpose of statesmanship is? Or does he think the Prime Minister doesn't need to engage in statesmanship? I mean, I feel very sorry for Miss Fraser, who I know is a distinguished barrister uh, before becoming a politician. And I've talked to many Conservative lawyers this week, and they are horrified by what's going on. Absolutely horrified. And I'm not remotely surprised that Lord Keane, who I was told was in some form of moral agony for the last two days, has resigned today. It's absolutely shameful to expect people whose uh, profession is the law and who, who either literally or metaphorically swear to uphold the rule of law have to, be, have to engage in these sort of shenanigans. They are hugely embarrassing and hugely humiliating, not just for the Conservative Party, by which I couldn't frankly care less, but hugely embarrassing and humiliating for our country. Um, Lucy Fraser, have you been through moral agonies yourself? But I think the point that you make is really important and what we're doing is uh, ensuring the integrity of the UK uh, and that is f absolutely important as is peace and... That's not quite what I asked. I asked if you'd had any moral agonies. 
Well, of course, like other MPs, I've considered um, the legislation and and, the, and uh, what we're trying to do here. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that we protect the integrity of the UK. Well, I, and I we're know, not in a position... You've said that three times now, but I, I want to know yourself as a, as a Conservative lawyer. Simon Heffer said he's talked to many Conservative li- lawyer, lawyers, not liars, Conservative lawyers... <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 we know who that is. Who, uh, uh, thank you, Simon. Um, who have been going through these agonies? I'm just asking if you have had any moral dilemmas yourself. Well, I've set out what uh, the after reading the legislation, talking to people, a number of people. Um, what what uh, what I think are are the points in favour of ensuring that this. I know, but Robert, Robert Buckland, your boss, the Secretary of State for Justice, in several interviews that I've seen him do, he clearly has gone through quite a few agonies on this. Yet you, you seem to be saying that, no, you've read it and you're absolutely fine with it. Well, I've read it, uh, I've looked at it very carefully, and um, I understand the reason why these steps are being taken. Uh, Robert Buckland, uh, as you know, has a, a constitutional duty um, as Lord Chancellor to uphold the rule of law. And, and, he's and in so do you as a Minister of absolutely, Justice. Absolutely, I have a, a job in the Ministry of Justice, a very important one in justice, um, and I'm pleased to have the benefit of a legal training and to um, have looked at these matters very closely. Jonathan Reynolds, um, this is almost an open goal for the Labour Party, but um, I detected early on that Keir Starmer was in a bit of a dile- moral dilemma about this himself, about whether, how far to go to oppose it. Well, I don't think anybody uh, enjoys this situation because what you have, I mean, this legislation, this deal, is a threat to the integrity of the United Kingdom. One of the reasons I didn't vote for the Prime Minister's deal is it is a threat to the integrity of the United Kingdom. When we voted for Brexit, and that has already now happened, so trying to continue the conversation, if that's the government's intention, is simply wrong. There were three possible outcomes to the, to the situation where we were leaving and the Republic of Ireland was not. The first one is a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, which clearly has a huge implication for the peace process. The second is a border between Northern Ireland and the island of Great Britain, which would have ramifications for you know the unionist community in Northern Ireland. And the third is a trade deal that makes the barrier much less of an issue. Doesn't make the problem go away, but gets it. Now The Prime Minister said he got a great deal. What he really did was go back, as we all know, and got a deal that Theresa May said no Prime Minister would sign. And she said, and I think, look, her deal had huge flaws as well, and the backstop was a a loss of, I think, sovereignty and a loss of prosperity, and I can understand why that didn't go through Parliament. But this is what the Prime Minister chose. And for issues between how we handle the detail of this, you know, that deal includes things like the Joint Committee to resolve these issues in good faith, negotiating with all parties. And the whole point of that is you can't unilaterally impose your will on it. So you might describe it as an open goal. I'm sad. I'm sad that our Prime Minister doesn't know the detail, would behave in this way. Obviously, Brexit's happened. There's no point trying to get into that argument. But does this improve our chances of a good trade deal? You know, does this improve our standing with our European partners going forward? No. Look at what people in Congress are saying about us. Look at what it's doing for the reputation. So no one can enjoy this. But the fact we've got to this position, it's either the Prime Minister not understanding his own deal or acting in extreme bad faith, and, and that's bad for the country. But of course, one of the reasons why Keir Starmer might have been reluctant to go too hard in on this was that uh, the Conservatives will be able to paint any uh, criticism of this as saying, well, Labour doesn't really believe in Brexit. And of course, the the voters in the red wall seats that voted for Boris Johnson last time, but traditional Labour voters, are not going to take very kindly to uh, the Labour Party adopting yet another so-called sort of remainery stance. Well, look, that is clearly their intention. We've all seen the email they sent sent out to their members, the tweet they sent out saying, you know, other opposition parties in Parliament are siding with the European Union. That kind of language, by the way, for any government right now, they should be clearly trying to bring the country together to some degree. The fact that they behave in that way, look, that's not by accident. They are making a, a fairly disastrous handling of the, of the pandemic right now. No one would deny that. Here's a good thing for them to divert attention away from that. And frankly, what worries me is they're clearly looking at this and saying, we can only win again or keep our support by keeping these, these horrible tensions which have riven the country for years live 
and, and feed them rather than try and heal them. And again, that's a bad thing for this country. And the strategy is clear. Um, people will make their own mind up as to whether that's the right way for the British government to behave. We're only 15 minutes into the programme and I already owe you an apology because I demoted you in my introduction. You are Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, not Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So apologies. Thank you. Has my mum been in touch already? That is, that is very <laughs> Some, uh, kind. Somebody of has. Uh, now, Simon in Reigate has a kind of allied question here. Um, Simon, go ahead. Yes, yes. So, 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 so um, uh, there was a leaked uh, YouTube video of Michel Barnier saying that he was going to use Ireland uh, um, as, as like a kind of get out clause on the Brexit I issue. Um, and therefore, and, and also as well, Boris Johnson has, uh, I, I saw a video of him today um, saying that he believes the EU is negotiating in bad faith. Um, and that this is, you know, kind of like a legal technical clause that wasn't meant to be, um, um, you know, you know, kind of just as a negotiating tool. So I guess I kind of want to ask the panel, what do they think about that? So do you think the EU are in negotiating in good faith? I guess that, that sums it up. Um, let's have some fairly short and pithy answers to this. Simon Heffer. Well, yes, they are, but they've been given the ability to do so by a Prime Minister signing a treaty he didn't understand. That was short and pithy. Mary Beard. I think it's always too easy to say the other side's negotiating in bad faith. I, I wonder how, what our faith looks like to the EU. Um, Lucy Fraser, Brandon Lewis uh, said the other day that he thought the EU were negotiating in good faith. You've got the Prime Minister today at the Liaison Committee saying he didn't think they were. Um, who do you side with, Brandon Lewis or the Prime Minister? Well, I'm not close enough to the negotiations. That's to, no get out. To, but, but it is interesting that Michel Barnier tweeted uh, recently, you know, the EU is not refusing to list the UK as the third country. To be listed, we need to know in full what a country's rules are, suggesting that, as I was saying, it's not refusing to allow uh, the UK, in Northern Ireland, to have um, unfettered access to the rest of the UK. Uh, of course, the EU know what uh, the uh, country's rules are because our country's rules are the same as the EU's. But they could change. Well, at the moment, uh, you know, the, the deal is done on the basis of the facts that uh, are present at the time, and, and the EU ought to know, uh, it ought to be able to decide whether to list us or not on the basis of what our country's rules are, because it knows full well what those rules are. Okay. Jonathan Reynolds? Yes, because they want a deal, and we want a deal, and if there isn't a deal, both sides will be to blame, but I think both sides do want a deal and are genuinely approaching it in that way. I just think this direction the government has taken is probably more about domestic domestic politics than being in the interest of good faith in a deal. And a just quick, a quick yes or no answer from each of you. Do you think, in your gut, that there will be a deal by the end of the year, or even by October the 15th? That seems to be the deadline. Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Lucy? I'm an optimist, so yes. Okay. Simon? No. Mary? No. Oh, well, do I get the casting vote then? I think I do. I, I think there will be, I have to say, um, even now. So let's hope so. Anyway, uh, we will take more of your calls in a moment on Cross Question 0345 6060 if you'd like to talk to our panel. Jonathan Reynolds, Lucy Fraser, Dame Mary Beard and Simon Heffer. It's 18 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Many things about the way we live our lives, including the way we shop and pay, have changed. So all next week, LBC will be partnering with Visa because how you pay matters. Every day we'll be joined by specialist guests to discuss topics ranging from fraud prevention when shopping online to making secure payments in person. That's this Monday and all next week, thanks to Visa. To find out more, head to lbc.co.uk. I'm worried about buying from this website. There's no company details. Buying online can be risky, but at Haynes Ford, we have been driving value since Ford arrived in 1911. Online or in-store, our friendly Ford experts can help you buy your next Ford car or commercial vehicle safely at a good price, arrange finance, and even deliver to your door. So for total peace of mind, click with us today at haynesford.co.uk. Always driving value. We all cough and sneeze occasionally. We can't change that. But you can help protect your staff and get your business going again with acrylic cough and sneeze screens from WorkShield. Designed to click together in seconds, there's a WorkShield for every use in every business. From just £73 delivered. 
Order now and save an extra 10% on all products with code RADIO. WorkShield. Get your business going. Price excludes 20% VAT. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone so you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Can you leave it round the back, please? Sure, no problem. And it's so simple, you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. With us in the studio, uh, Lucy Fraser, Minister of State for Justice, Jonathan Reynolds, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, see I can get it right, Simon Heffer, Professor of Modern History at the University of Buckingham, and Dame Mary Beard, Professor of Classics at Cambridge University. Well, let's go to our next caller, who is uh, Niall. Is that how I pronounce it, Niall? Am I right in Barrow and Finesse? Yeah, that's correct. Hi, good evening. Fantastic. What's your question, please? Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, is there a role for private businesses to be testing their own employees for coronavirus, given the testing issues? Uh, let's go to Jonathan Reynolds first. I think there are some cases where businesses will need to uh, find out or do testing amongst their workforce, not because it's a public health issue, but because it's a preventative measure. And I think actually there are some firms who are engaging in activities like that. But, you know, in a sense, I think now that's something of a, of a diversion because the, the crucial thing is right now what we need on any, in any part of the country, on any aspect of this crisis is, is a way that people can access the public health functions for testing and tracing and get hold of the epidemic that way and it just isn't working at the minute i mean in greater manchester where i live not only are infection rates really spiraling out of control but you know the infrastructure there just isn't working and i don't know why you have to put in a false postcode to get a local test i mean that seems to me not even a capacity problem but some sort of you know error in the system and how it is working so look there may be ways now to, to a to get additional capacity into the system but none of that will really matter unless that the core function that we have the public test and trace system is responding adequately and i i, I feel from what i've seen so far Part of the problem has been that the existing local plans, the infrastructure that was in place for public health uh, teams to cover this has somehow in many cases been overridden by national contracts being given out and not built on that system. I think that is part of the problem, but right now we are missing, even the people who can get tests, you know, we're missing thousands of people a week in some big cities that really need to be traced, and that is a huge problem. But the Prime Minister says we, we are testing more people than any other country in Europe. Now, that on the face of it, would seem to be a success. Well, it was astonishing to hear him say that, because I didn't think there was any controversy over the fact that the system went completely haywire over the last few days. I mean, look, every MP has stories of people in their constituency being sent hundreds of miles to get a test. And it was clearly, the strange thing is, sometimes people from other areas are contacting you as the MP, saying, I've been sent near your area to get tested, and I, my people, my constituents, can't get a local test, and they're being sent there. So it is an error of the system and I just expected the Prime Minister to say, look, there have been problems, I'm on it, this is what the plan is to do it. Uh, again, just to bluster through where we're testing loads of people, you know, we, should, we deserve praise. Look, it isn't working at the minute. The, the infections in my borough are over 100 per 100,000, so in other words, we're getting to the levels that we're, we were on the precipice of. I, I'm instantly moving away from you. Well, I, I, <laughs> it, 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 does, it does feel a little bit like that. It's it, given less... the last politician in the studio was Sir Keir Starmer, and as soon as he left, um, he had to go into self-isolation, so... That, that that, that was a family issue. Yeah, I mean, but you know, so that, that is that is it. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't think the, this prime minister, you know, even not speaking as an opposition MP, I just don't think he's the kind of prime minister for a crisis like this. I think you want someone serious and on the detail, it, be that even, you know, a, a Theresa May type figure who had to be a conservative, but I just don't think this is the well, natural skill set. I'll bring back Theresa May, Lucy Fraser. I know you can't say that, even if you think it. But, I mean, Jonathan has got a point, hasn't he, here? Because um, an LBC survey earlier this week, and this is really, I think, the basis of uh, it was the basis of John Ashworth's UQ yesterday, showed that there were no tests available in the top ten um, infected areas. Now that on the face of it, it's preposterous that people in those areas cannot get tested. It means that the infection rates will inevitably rise. Look, I know it's very frustrating for people in their local areas who, who want tests and um, aren't getting them 
uh, immediately in, in the vicinity of their local area. The reason that, that this has happened is because demand has gone up and it's gone up because we have opened up schools and we've opened up the economy. So more that people... Foreseeable. That was foreseeable. That was foreseeable and we've done a lot of work on it. Uh, but it's really important we, did, we took those steps. You know, as a parent uh, and speaking to lots of teachers and uh, parents in my constituency, people uh, welcome the move to open up schools and I know people are welcome the opportunity to go back to work so that was right so people are going are needing more tests we anticipated that as you rightly say and capacity has significantly increased so in march we had capacity to do 2000 tests a day we now have capacity to do a quarter of a million tests but they're not being done that's the point it doesn't matter what capacity you've got if you're not doing the tests the system isn't working so so those tests are being carried out it's very high rate uh, at which uh, those tests tests are being done. 62,000 tests, I believe, were carried out yesterday. We, we, um, we're not only in, uh, we not only have had uh, an increase in capacity, we are continuing uh, to increase the capacity. Uh, so we're opening up and new centres. It's the lab capacity that you need to increase. It's not the actual number of tests that people can take, because if the labs can't keep up, inevitably there's going to be a big backlog. And we are increasing the lab capacity but too as late. well. Well, we've worked over the summer to do this and to, we've increased it significantly over that period. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, comparative, this is a, an issue that's affecting countries worldwide as the issue of PPE affected countries okay. worldwide. This was a pandemic, but comparatively, as you said uh, earlier, we are ahead uh, of our counterparts um, in other countries. Simon Heffer, how fair is it to blame the politicians here? Because clearly, um, I would say the, the whole infrastructure of the test and tracing system, that isn't under the control of politics. Politicians, I imagine that Matt Hancock is as frustrated as anybody. Yes, yeah, so what politicians need to stop doing is boasting about how good it is because people don't take them seriously and it reduces their credibility and it causes anger in the country. And if you are in one of these 10 most infected areas and you can't get a test, the, the purely rhetorical uh, test regime that you're told exists by senior politicians cuts no ice with you at all and will make you very upset. Um, I, to answer the original question that the gentleman answered, uh, that to answer it, that the gentleman asked earlier, I've got no ideological problem with the private sector doing anything it can to help alleviate this chaos and this shambles that's going on at the moment. And so, if there are big private sector firms, either that want to test their employees or want to come in and, and offer a, um, a, an availability of tests to the general public, then good luck to them. And I think that the uh, that, that, uh, Mr. Hancock should be facilitating that and encouraging it because we're clearly not getting very far at the moment with leaving it just to the government to do it. Mary Beard, I saw you um, cheering Simon Heffer there, something I never thought I would see happen. I, I'm finding myself uh, deeply either pleased or embarrassed, Dr Heffer, because I find myself agreeing with you more often than I disagree with I don't know what that says. <laughs> However... Everyone um, gets more right-wing as they get old, Mary. Oh, don't tell me that. Not that you're getting old, he said hastily. <laughs> 65 in a day. Come on. Look, I'm not a politician and I'm not a key worker, but this makes me feel, and not just upset, it makes me feel really angry. And that's because I think 99% of the British population want to be on side over this. We, you know, we, we want to help. We want things to go okay. We're also... Uh, we understand that it's damn difficult. You know, nobody's thinking that this is simple. But what what we, I think, and I'm speaking for, you know, lots of people on the outside like me, what we can't bear is the, is the false optimism, the promises that can't be delivered, and the sort of boosterism about how everything's wonderful and we're doing better than everybody else. And oh, by the way, soon we're going to have millions tested each day. Look, if you want us to be on side, you have to share the problems. We have to be in this together. We can't be in a position where we just mentally switch off when we hear that we've got a world-beating test and trace system when we all know we haven't and that that is the way of, of losing our kind of sense of engagement with this and if you lose people's loyalty over this you really risk dangerous behavior and you risk people just giving up on what the government wants them to do. So I think it's not just, you know, a bits of bluster by the Prime Minister, it's dangerous bluster. Hmm. Jonathan. 
Well, I'm also struggling reconciling, agreeing with everything Simon is is saying, and and um, in the same position as Mary. Gosh, one point yeah. I do just want to make is, um, I my my local area is one of the hotspots, as I just explained that the LBC covered yesterday, and sometimes I saw on the on the Twitter feed you know, comments I get people saying, stop talking about testing. What about hospitalisations? Look, I mean, a third of all the people whose deaths were listed as COVID deaths last week in this country were in my local hospital. Okay, so I don't want to tell my constituents the Prime Minister says everything's world beating we deserve a pat on the back for doing it you know this is a real problem he's got to respond properly to that because there are some people who say well look if, if you look at the death rates at, at the moment it, it's about 10 per day uh, the hospitalization rates are starting to creep up but not in any dramatic way uh, some people are saying look this is all ridiculous we can't have these extra measures to sort of lock people down even locally because it, it's just not worth it from the economic point of view in fact we We've got a question on that coming up in a moment, so we'll leave that discussion until then. Um, not a single question yet on the rule of six, which I'm quite surprised by, so if you want to ask about that, 0345 6060973, the future of the furlough scheme you might want to talk about, or indeed something completely different, maybe the plight of the Uyghurs in China. Not, not wanted to lead you in any way, you understand. 0345 6060973. 834 on LBC, you're listening to Quest. If you'd like to watch us, you can do so on the Global Player, on YouTube or Facebook or the LBC Twitter feed. Let me just reintroduce my panel to you. Uh, Dame Mary Beer joins us from Cambridge. Simon Heffer is in my seat in the Luster Square studio. Because of social distancing, we can't have you all in the studio, so we have to sort of uh, mix and match as we can. Lucy Fraser is Conservative Minister for Justice and Jonathan Reynolds, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary. Uh, right, let's go to Kevin in Southwark. Hi, Kevin. Kevin, what would you like to ask? Yeah, good evening, uh, and thank you for inviting me to the, uh, speak on the programme. Um, my question is, why is the UK government's track record over the past nine months in terms of COVID deaths per million and economic performance in terms of GDP growth rate so much poorer than other comparable countries such as Germany, Sweden, France, Japan and Korea? Jonathan. Well, there's a few reasons for it. I think any country would be hit uh, very hard by COVID if they're an open economy and, and have the kind of structure of employment that we have. But I feel that in the government's response, where it has been in some places widely praised, I mean, you know, the furlough scheme was something every uh, side of the House of Commons wanted. Um, there has been, frankly, not enough grip on the health side, and that is what has led to uh, the problems with test and trace. And if you look at the Particularly the employment figures this week. You know what, you, what we've got is something unusual, which is the good thing in the economy, which is some people are going back to work. It is a result of unfreezing the economy. But the bad thing, which is more and more people are losing their jobs, is also the result of that thing because the businesses that aren't returning to normal have to make people redundant. I, I think crucially this is probably the most important time as furlough comes to an end i think what we absolutely need to see and this is where the labor party the tuc the, the cbi are all in the same place is not the extension of the furlough scheme unilaterally but the targeted support at the sectors that can't possibly keep people in their jobs because they can't return to normal um you know other countries have taken that step. Uh, I don't think there's any real controversy about the fact that that is still needed, and I just cannot understand. We had working pensions questions on, on Monday. You know, in a situation where more and more people are losing their jobs, uh, food banks are saying destitution will double by Christmas unless something is done. You can't just keep repeating, well, we've done these things six months ago at the beginning of the crisis. We've got nothing planned for the future. So there has to be uh, further changes, Kevin. There's no doubt about that. In terms of the general response of the government, look, I think the Prime Minister sets the tone for that. And I think there is too much of this government uh, which isn't on the detail, which isn't, frankly, competent. And I think all of that, I'm afraid, does come down to the Prime Minister, his approach to government, his own work ethic, his own approach uh, to the job. And it just isn't what we need for you, these difficult times. You're going to have Simon Heffer agreeing with you in a moment. Um, ju just on that, just on that, though... Um, do you not draw any encouragement from the fact that if you look at the bounce back of economic growth, it does look a bit of a V-shape? Everyone was thinking, well, this V-shape recovery is not going to happen, but it does look as if it is. Well, I don't feel comfortable yet, simply because, I mean, if you look at where the unemployment figure is obviously a three-month average, so it still covers the peak of furlough. You've got the Bank of England as essentially now, I'd say, the best case scenario prediction, which is 7.5% unemployment rising to. The OBR prediction is, is way higher than that. And I think probably too higher. But, you know, 
I look at that information and then I, you've explained and you've reported on the situation in a constituency like mine and you can see why I'm a little mm. bit scared for the future and, and you know I don't you put in my, my own constituents emailing me tweeting me saying we can't get a test today we can't get our results back what are we supposed to do I look at the school outbreaks uh, the bubbles that have been sent home because of that and it is a really worrying picture so you know Nobody wants a return to mass levels of unemployment. We all know what that would mean for the country. I just, at the minute, you know, it's hard to be optimistic. Um, Simon Heffer, can you be optimistic in any way? And do you think Kevin Akula is fair when, when he compares this country's performance, both on COVID and on the economy, with a lot of very, very different countries? Are these international comparisons fair? It is difficult to make comparisons. And I was going to say in answer to an earlier question that I... I think that um, while I accept what was just said about uh, the present Prime Minister's uh, incapacities, this would have tested any government at any time, yeah. whoever, whoever led it, and I think we must all agree on that. But um, it seems to me that the large burden of extra deaths in this country was because of a really appalling policy towards people in care homes. It seemed that we were unloading sick people from hospitals into care homes where they were infecting num a number of others. And this can't be allowed to happen again. I think we do treat care homes and people in them as sort of Cinderella part of, uh, of our care for, uh, for, for vulnerable people. And I think it's going to be something that's really going to shame this country when the history of this time comes to be written. It's another reason why, by the way, I think we should have an urgent start to the public inquiry that's needed into this. Because if we get a second wave later in the winter, I'd like to think that there was a slightly uh, more um, sensible and intelligent and preventative uh, policy in place to stop some small holocaust going through the care home sector and killing lots of elderly people because what's happened in the last few months has been absolutely terrible. As for the economy, I'm not quite so pessimistic about that. Uh, there's an awful, this, is a, this is a recession we're in at the moment which has not been caused by the conventional means, which is economic mismanagement. It's been caused by a government saying we have to close the economy down for three months as we, as we normally understand it. And I hope that that will come back. There's, there is a big structural change in the economy, and this is the question of working from home. This was, of course, underway before COVID came along. There were more and more people who, using technology such as video links, were able to work from home, and the, the internet is a great facilitator of this. And while some people will go back to work, and many people will enjoy doing it, of course, because of the camaraderie of their colleagues, particularly people in creative businesses who, uh, who, who feed off the, uh, the intelligence of the people they work with, um, there will be many people who will either not go back to an office at all or only go back one or two days a week and that is going to have a very serious effect on certain areas where there are concentrations of offices however people who are not commuting are spending money locally people won't stop spending money um, they'll just spend it somewhere differently okay what's what's very unfortunate are those people who've got jobs in areas that are as it were being depopulated by the working population and something has to be done to look after them Mary is bursting at the yeah. seams to get in. Yeah, because I'm agreeing with Simon yet again, but I want to take <laughs> the Oh, sh heaven, sorry. Um, you know, I'm not a Tory. Uh, um, I, I think what Simon is putting his finger on here, though, is, you know, for all the faults of the government, they didn't set out to make a mess of it. It was damn hard. They did make a bit of a mess of it. Um, but you know, and that's compounded by their over-optimism and their boost prism and whatever. But for me, I, I mean, I think there are some pressing immediate economic issues here, but Simon's pointing to something in the future and in the medium term. And what I would like to think is that there was somebody, a couple of boffins at least, in some basement in Whitehall who were thinking about some of those big changes that we might be able to capitalise on. You know, what are we going to do with centres of cities if um, uh, many people don't go back to work in their offices as before. Uh, is this the time when we could really rethink what, you know, what university admissions and A levels are all about? You know, is the pandemic, uh, as well as needing to be kind of treated and the and the tragedy that is offered to all kinds of people needed to be assuaged? Could someone be thinking that we could? we could take some of these problems and make something of it. I mean, I was looking the other day and I, I, I realised the NHS 
was invented during the Second World War. Well, if they can invent the NHS during World War II, then couldn't we actually start to think about these big issues that Simon's talking about and have a medium term plan so that we come out of this with a new view of how we work, how we live, what democracy is like, what education is like. Let's get on with it, not just be reactive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... <coughs> Tom in Kettering says, I'm a prison officer. Have COVID rates in prisons been the government's secret success story? Well, that's an easy one for you, uh, Lucy, because I must admit, when this all started, that was one of my big fears, that I mean, the prison population would probably be uh, worse affected than anywhere else. But it, it, put that to one side. But how, how do you react to what um, Kevin was asking there about the international comparisons? And it's quite clear that our death rates have been much higher than virtually anywhere else. Well, can I, can I start with that in, sure relation, in, in relation to prisons? And thank you for all your work <coughs> as prison officer, because prison officers have done a tremendous job uh, throughout this pandemic. They have really risen to the challenge. So we were looking, our, uh, the advice that we got as we entered into the pandemic uh, was that we were looking at two and a half to three and a half thousand deaths in prisons. And uh, because we acted early, we took a number of steps. We worked very closely with uh, Public Health England and we had tremendous, tremendous work by our prison officers, our governors. Um, we've had 23 deaths. Now, every death is obviously tragic, but I think that is remarkable and that is down uh, to the work of the prison officers. Does it frustrate you, though, that everyone concentrates on all of the failures, and I'm, I'm sure you would admit there have been failures, and nobody talks about where things have gone right. Well, I do generally find that. Because yeah. um, we're British. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that uh, when news is good, it's it's rarely reported on. But, but we've been saying it quite a lot in the Ministry of Justice and really proud of the work that HMPPS has done. And just to pick up on that point, uh, to something that Mary said in relation to learning. So we in our department are looking very carefully at lessons learned and what can we do better um, in the prison service and in the probation service and what can we take them from that so for instance uh, you know both uh, Simon and Mary talked about technology so we were in the process uh, before Covid hit of rolling out video visits but it was a very slow process you know it would have taken years probably to roll it out in, in prisons and uh, we rolled it out in a number of months so now you get you can have prison visits through technology in prisons and that was a great relief for prisoners who were we stopped visits to stop the pandemic uh, but just on on the wider point do you do you accept that in many areas there have been terrible failings which have I mean, simon talked about uh, care homes and social care that, that that has resulted in many more deaths than there needed to have been in retrospect i would be amazed if we got everything right as a government you know this was an uh, 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 a, a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, which we weren't prepared for in the sense that, you know, we didn't have the hospital capacity or the ventilator capacity or the PPE supplies. And we've had to build all those up um, from from March. And uh, yes, yeah, you know, those things have taken some time. But I think the government has uh, done those things in a way that if we uh, do see a second wave, we are very much more prepared for it. Um, and just, you know, on the deaths, if we, if we take deaths and hospitalizations as you know as a as a measure you know, in april uh, we were looking at you know, 945 deaths uh, on the 14th of april and yesterday we had 27 so we've come a long way you know we've put in a lot of measures we haven't got everything right but we've done a great deal as a government and there is still absolutely more to do um, Terry and Hammersmith says, would the panel be comfortable going back into the office? Well, I guess the fact that Jonathan and Lucy are here shows that you have gone back into the office. In the world of academia, Simon and Mary, um, that isn't necessarily the case, though, is it? That um, a lot of things are still being done remotely. Mary, first. Yeah, we're doing um, big lectures remotely. And, you know, my, my suspicion is, and this is kind of picking up something that Lucy's just said, that, um, uh, that the pandemic will have speeded up all kinds of changes in universities um, that were happening anyway, you know, and maybe lectures will now go on being online. Um, we are, however, putting great store by trying so far as is possible, and heaven knows what's going to happen in mid-October, to have 
uh, face-to-face teaching for small groups. But, uh, but I think it is really, really important to, uh, you know, a, do what we can to get over this, but also to do what we can to say, right, this is going to have speeded up changes. What changes do we want it to have speeded up? What is a university going to look like in two years' time? Where are students going to live? How many contact hours will they have? What can we charge them if they're being taught online? And we need to be grasping those issues because actually something, you know, for all the terrible disasters, something good could come out of this, you know. But if it is going to come out of it, it needs a bit of action and a bit of planning okay. and not a kind of sense business as usual. Simon, are you back to business as usual? Well, uh, my university at Buckingham is um, much like every other university trying to return to normal and is has a mixture of, uh, of online teaching but also students going back to the campus. Um, the, I teach postgraduates and we uh, would normally have face-to-face seminars this autumn. We've postponed them until um, January, so we hope from January till about June we can run the 10 seminar programme that we have on my course instead of starting it now. We hope that there'll be fewer restrictions then and that, that will be face to face and we'll all hope be in the same room in my other life as a as a journalist um i've i've to answer the question i've started coming to london again i hadn't been to london for six months until last week and i've started coming to london again and meeting contacts and catching up with people and obviously everywhere i've been going there have been enormous precautions being taken i keep having my temperature taken and having to sanitize my hands uh i'm not being complacent but i i think that given all the uh precautions that are in place i'm, I'm pretty confident that um if if something kills me it won't be covid not just yet anyway <laughs> Jonathan, very quickly. I do agree this will change work and will accelerate changes, but I just want to say I hope people recognise this has affected people in very different ways. Some of us have been working from home on our laptops in a study, you know, rather pleasant environment, not commuting. For other people... I follow you on Instagram. They, I've absolutely, seen, I've seen exactly. For other people, they have... He has been working. They have lost, the um, they've lost their income or they've had to go to work in unsafe conditions. And I just hope, building on Mary's point, which I, which I agree with, people recognise that variation. And actually some people have been, you know, their working experience, their conditions has been shown to be something that is really something many of us would never want to face and that's got to be part of the national process coming out of it. Well I think the one thing we can take from all of that is that we're looking forward to uh, watching Mary's online lectures um, hopefully <laughs> not having to pay £9,000 a year for the pleasure of it. Uh, we'll take more of your calls in a moment. It's 10 to 9. Uh, let's go to our next questioner. Uh, Munesh is in Hounslow. Munesh what would you like to ask? Oh, hi, good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. I would like to ask the panel, which one of you or more of you MPs would take the full responsibility of the failures of the lack of the lab capacity testing, the COVID testing site capacity, the online web applications and generation of reference codes, and the bad, incompetent government management of the issues? And secondly, when will my daughter, who needs to go to school, get tested? An exact date, please, if that's, if that's okay. Well, Jonathan, it's a bit unfair to hold you responsible for it, given you're not even in the governing party, but um, that, that was Munashi's question. Um, I, I mean, we have kind of covered a bit of this before, but it, it, how much political responsibility should be taken by the government for something that is inevitably, in many ways, a failure of administration? Well, I think you can hear it in Munesh's question there. He's clearly personally directly affected by this, and you can understand, you know, how people feel. Many of my constituents are exactly in the position he is in. The government has to be held accountable for the actions of the government, the behaviour of the government, and the failings of the government. I, it, clearly, you know... No one is trying to say this would be easy, but I'm, for instance, I'm absolutely of the view that it was right to bring children back to school. My own children have been off school for 160 days. One of my children attends a special educational needs school. It really impact on that, on that loss of routine. I expected the government to anticipate that would require a significant amount of testing capacity. The test and trace system would have to be fit for that. You know, the fact they'd been off school for so long, there was time, I think, to prepare for that return. And, and now, frankly, I'm wondering, given how many large universities there are in Greater Manchester, I, I hope we're ready for the, the arrival of students in significant numbers into the conurbation, given where we are at. It, 
a crucial problem, which is directly the responsibility of politicians, has been the communication around this. The communication has got a lot clearer with the rule of six, but up until that announcement, in Greater Manchester you had different rules for each of the ten boroughs. So, you know, you could go to a casino in Bolton, but you couldn't go to a pub, you could go to a, a pub in Stockport. You know, there were different rules mm. affecting all of Greater Manchester and the rest of the country, and different rules within it, frankly, because some of the different political persuasions had lobbied for right. different rules. Right, I'm going to ask for short answers, because we are running out of time. Um, Lucy Fraser, uh, it's a fair point that Munesh makes. Um, surely politicians do have to take responsibility. Or do you hold um, Dido Harding to account for the failures? I mean, I don't know what her qualification was for this job, but um, from the outside, it seems as though it hasn't been done very well. Well, of course, government takes some responsibility for um, getting these measures in place. But um, as I mentioned earlier, it's work been working very hard and has managed to increase capacity on a number of levels you know I too like Jonathan as a parent share Minesh's frustrations about school but I'm really pleased that you know 99% of schools have uh, have gone back um, I spoke to uh, all the heads um, uh, of schools who who wanted to take part in a, a zoom call with me about a week ago and you know the work that they did over the summer to get people back the students back at school has been phenomenal and uh, in terms of testing because Minesh uh, mentioned testing Testing. You know, we are prioritising a number of cohorts, including the NHS and children, because th those are our priorities. Are children being prioritised? I, I didn't... I have, that one's passed me by. I thought it was NHS workers and social care. That was... Uh, my understanding is, is um, okay. that, that, that was... Um, Simon Heffer. Uh, I think it's quite clear under our constitution that the minister is responsible. I mean, anybody who wants to know more about this, we haven't got much time now, should look up on Wikipedia the Critchell Down case of 1954, where the then Minister of Agriculture, Tommy Dugdale, mm. was not aware that a piece of land had been confiscated from somebody and not given back to them. Uh, but he had to resign anyway. Uh, I think Mr Hancock's well aware of how bad things are on the National Health Service. Uh, if Dido Harding's made a mess of, uh, of her responsibilities, well, it's down to him to sack her and uh, um, uh, but also to take responsibility for overseeing her appointment in the first place. It, it seems that deputy heads roll here, civil servants heads roll, but politicians heads don't roll, Mary Beard. Yeah, well, I'm going to slightly part company with Dr Heffer here, you'll be pleased to know. Um, and it so had to I'm, happen. It had to happen. I'm, um, I, I, I'm very much in favour of, of, you know, politicians carrying the can. But I think we also have to realise that we voted for them, right? We can vote them out. And in the end, we have to take responsibility for the lot we gave ourselves. So just let's think. Now we have a final text question. This is always the, this is always the bit that um, people dread on this program, but um, I'd rather like it. Uh, Craig in Burton on Trent says, "Ian, which ancient Greek figure does the Prime Minister remind the panel of most?" My shout is Alcibiades. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Mary will correct me if I haven't. Um, well, let's broaden this out to historical characters. Um, Simon Heffer, who does Boris Johnson remind you of? Well, I was tempted to say the Minotaur, but I'd like to move forward um, <laughs> uh, a couple of centuries. He's obviously Nero, isn't he? Oh, Simon. Too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Despite Mary? the fact he's not paying a fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? Um, well, it's Alcibiades, who was um, right. a, a, a well-known, glamorous um, traitor in Athens. I mean, I think this is always a, a hopelessly difficult question because everybody you think of, there's some, there's some nasty sting in the tail. And the Prime Minister would like me to say uh, Pericles, yes. who was uh, a leader of the Athenian democracy, a big spender, a bigger up of Athenian achievement and Athenian culture, who ruled the roost over Athenian democracy for a good few years. The sting in the tail in this case is that Pericles also presided over a pandemic <coughs> and unlike the Prime Minister, he didn't recover and he died in it. 
On that note, Lucy Fraser, your job is hanging by a thread depending well, on your answer. Well, yeah. well, well, um, I'm going to caveat it then in it because <laughs> my knowledge of uh, Greek um, uh, history is extremely limited and I'm sure, like Mary, whatever I say, there'll be twists and turns. But I'm going to say, just on the extremely limited knowledge that I've got and only in relation to uh, the points that I make, I'm going to say Atlas because he carried the world on his shoulders. And I think, you know, whatever you think about Boris Johnson, he's ha- he's got uh, he's had a really uh, tough premiership, pre- tough leadership. You know, he's dealt with Brexit. He's had a pandemic. He's almost died. He's moved house, had a baby, uh, and is getting married. I think you know he's 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 had a really tough ass. But unlike over the Atlas, last let's years. hope he keeps his keeps his shirt on, Jonathan. <laughs> the pressure was on doing a historical reference after Simon and Mary, but I was also like Simon going to say one of the less good uh, Roman emperors, but I was going to say Caligula, but I'm accidentally <laughs> defaming the Prime Minister in an even bigger way. So apologies if that is the I case. remember seeing that film when I was 18. It had a deep oh. effect on me. But that's, sadly, we've run out of time, so I can't tell you any more about it. Uh, Lucy, Mary, Simon, Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. If you've missed any of it, you can watch it again on YouTube, on Global Player, and the podcast will be up before midnight.